Well, let's pray before we dive into God's Word today. Thank you, Father. You've said you're with us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, in the fire, in the waters. You're with us because we're complete in you. We're completely united to you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for that grace. Help us to understand this. Help us to understand that we are complete in you, lacking nothing. Help me as I share your word today and prepare hearts to listen. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we begin today, I would like to read today's Bible quote together. It's the same as last week's Bible quote, and it's John 1.16. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace, John 1.16. It says we have all received grace upon grace. We are all recipients of God's grace, but sometimes it's hard for us to see this. We fail to see how in need of God's grace we really have been. Or we err in the opposite direction and we think falsely that we've sinned too much or we've suffered too much abuse for the light to reach us. Sometimes we become too ashamed to even reach out to the only one who can save us. Such is the wrong thinking I would like to address today. This is the second of two talks on God's astonishing grace. Last week, we talked about how God took a Moabitess of the accursed race of Moab and made her one of the ancestors of Jesus. The Moabitess was called Ruth, and Ruth remains one of the most astonishing examples of God's grace in the Bible. We talked about how if we were to humble ourselves before God and seek him diligently, we too could be like Ruth and receive a godly inheritance, even if we don't have a godly background. The title of today's talk is Astonishing Grace, the Eunuch. The Eunuch. What is a eunuch? A eunuch is a man whose reproductive organs have been removed. In ancient times, in certain cultures, some kings had many wives. Eunuchs were typically employed to work with those wives and sometimes to rule over them. In order to prevent any illicit relationships between eunuchs and the king's wives, eunuchs had to undergo this procedure before entering into the king's service. Typically, the procedure was done at a young age before puberty. It was, however, a devastating procedure with lifelong effects. Because of the lack of testosterone, eunuchs typically ended up with very high-pitched voices, could not grow facial hair, were not muscular, and were unusually tall because they lacked male hormones that suppress growth after a certain age. And of course, eunuchs could not father children. In the ancient Near East, this was seen as a curse because one could not have offspring to carry on one's name. So why would anyone want to become a eunuch in the first place? Why would anyone go through such a degrading procedure, suffer the medical consequences, and bar oneself from ever fathering children? Well, I doubt if anyone ever chose this for himself. The choice was often made for them. If a family was poor, for example, the family may choose a young boy to become a eunuch because this ensured financial security for the whole family. In other cases, captured prisoners of war were forcibly castrated and made eunuchs to serve in the victor's royal court. This is recorded in the Bible on several occasions. In either case, it's important to note 
the boy probably had very little choice in the matter. So why should we talk about eunuchs? Because in the Bible, eunuchs, I suggest, are a picture of the devastation of sin in this world and the restoring grace that is only available in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, if we follow the story arc of the eunuchs, we will find in the beginning there was rejection, guilt, and shame. But we'll find at the end a new believer rejoicing, namely the Ethiopian eunuch of Acts 8. If we allow the story of eunuchs to move us, we too will discover the astonishing grace God has for us. As I, tell this, as I tell this story, many of us may begin to realize that we too were once eunuchs in a sense, but have received grace upon grace. So let us dive into this story of eunuchs. Let's look at our first point in the sermon notes today. The first point says, the bad news the bad news, those who, were, who are not whole can, cannot enter God's assembly. So your fill-in word here is bad, bad, the bad news. Those who are not whole cannot enter God's assembly. Although many countries in the ancient Near East had eunuchs as part of their society, Israel had instituted no eunuchs in its royal courts. Part of the reason is that eunuchs were considered unclean in Israel and were not allowed in God's assembly. Let's look at a scripture that tells us this. In Deuteronomy 23 verse 1, it says, No one who has been emasculated by crushing or cutting may enter the assembly of the Lord. And that was Deuteronomy 23.1. Now, this law was given by God himself. So even if you were a eunuch because of an accident, you were not allowed to enter God's assembly. I believe this law was to show God's holiness. It showed that God is holy and his people were to be set apart. It was an illustration of how the holy has to be separated from the profane, and the clean must be separated from the unclean. The law also shows us that, in principle, anything broken, anything not whole, anything damaged cannot be in God's presence. That's how holy he is. Now, this law was actually in line with the sacrificial law for animals. The same kind of law uh, was for animals as well. And the sacrificial uh, law for animals also showed the importance of wholeness. And it too illustrates holiness for us. Let's have a look at that law. It's in your notes. Let's read Leviticus chapter 22 and the first part of verse says, you must not offer to the Lord an animal whose testicles were bruised, crushed, torn, or cut. Perhaps because of the potent image, of its potent image as the source of life, the Old Testament also had a very severe punishment for those who would want to attack a man in his private parts. There is a very symbolic law Deuteronomy 25, verses 11 to 12. Let's read this. If two men are fighting and the wife of one of them comes to rescue her husband from his assailant and she reaches out and seizes him by his private parts, you shall cut off her hand. Show her no pity. 
What are we to make of this? Now, instead of dismissing this law as something random, too severe, or arcane to our modern ears, we can perhaps understand this law, I believe, together with the ban on eunuchs. The particular part of the anatomy from which life issues is, I think, a symbol of what is important to God, because God is life. Life is holy and cannot be cheapened or violated. And the laws are a sobering reminder of that. You may argue, well, this ban on eunuchs doesn't make sense. It wasn't fair. People typically didn't choose to be eunuchs, so why would the Lord exclude someone who was maimed not by his own choice, but by the decision of others, or because of an accident, for example? Our human anger wants to rise in indignation. We may be tempted to blame God or even judge God. But actually, this indignation ought to be against sin, not against God. You see, God cannot change the way he is. He is perfect, so nothing imperfect can come into his presence. In theory, actually, all human beings should be excluded from his presence. This law against eunuchs serves to actually illustrate God's holiness. And in fact, God was much holier than that. But to people, to the people under law, the Israelites, this prohibition against eunuchs at least illustrated the holiness of God. God, we learn, is pure and whole and will only allow pure and whole beings in his presence. The sad state of the eunuch also serves to remind us of this truth. We never cho chose to inherit original sin, did we? Yet, we have all become slaves to sin. We are all guilty and are barred from a holy and perfect God. Our sympathy for the eunuch should also stir up our hatred towards sin. And it should make us lament the hopelessness of our original state. Imagine you were a eunuch in Old Testament times. As a eunuch, there was nothing you could do to restore yourself to the assembly of God. You were con condemned to a lifetime of worshipping from far away. In the same way, there was nothing we could do as sinners before we came to Christ. We were condemned, relegated to the outer courts. Although the most diligent of us may have wanted to reach God by our own efforts through religious, religious activity, when we found out we could never reach him, we ended up in despair. And this is the desperate state of fallen humanity. Bad news. You would be absolutely right to say that eunuchs didn't choose their state for themselves. Being forced to become a eunuch was an ancient form of what we may, we may call today abuse. No one chooses abuse, yet abuse occurs. We live in this sinful world where the effects of sin are all around us. At the very least, we all age because of the effects of sin, and we all get sick sometimes, and we have accidents. We suffer from natural disasters and the devastation of our environment, and we all die unless the Lord appears before that day. Perhaps the most heart-wrenching effect of sin is when a man chooses to harm another. It is especially devastating if it happens in the form of abuse. I would suggest that the law against the eunuch is a powerful reminder of the effects of abuse. Abuse is a terrifying manifestation of sin. Abuse strikes us tragically and seemingly randomly, and it is not our fault. 
yet as a result we are tainted. In the perverse way that sin works, those who are abused often become more enslaved to sin. They inflict more sin on others because of something done to them. And the cycle of sin continues. Like a eunuch, like the eunuch, many of you listening may have suffered trauma. Things were done to you that have scarred your body and your psyche. Things have never been the same, you may feel, since the, the abuse occurred. I want to say to you that, that your abuse should never have happened. It was wrong. And I grieve with you. But abuse can be a pathway to God. And I don't say this flippantly, nor do I want to minimize uh, any abuse that you have uh, suffered or the enormity of that sin or your suffering. But I do know this. Where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. Grace abounds even more for you. Just as a eunuch was daily reminded of the devastation of sin in his own body and the imperfection of this sinful world, my prayer is that you will understand this is just the beginning point, just the starting point of your journey toward God. Abuse can highlight one thing, the ugly nature of sin, but it can also highlight to us the only one who can deliver us. Is there a solution for you if you have been ab abused like the eunuch? I believe there is. The journey takes us, as always, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at our second point today. The second point says, the good news. The good news Jesus' wholeness means those who are not whole can enter God's assembly. That's the good news. Hallelujah. We can enter now. So eunuchs were prohibited from God's assembly in order to demonstrate God's holiness, as I mentioned before. But God never forgot them. Salvation for eunuchs was actually predicted even in Old Testament times, even as the prohibition against eunuchs was in place. The prophet Isaiah cried out, If a eunuch would obey God by choosing things that please God and choosing God's things is a sign of faith, then that eunuch would have an inheritance from the Lord. Let's read this prophecy from Isaiah chapter, 50, uh, chapter 56, verses 3 to 5. Verse 3 says, Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. The next verse, uh, verse 4 says, For thus says the Lord, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast to my covenant, next verse, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. This promise is astonishing given its historical context, because eunuchs could not have a monument and a name in the Old Testament. You had no monument and no name if you did not have sons and daughters. Now, on this side of the cross, we understand the concept of spiritual children. But in the Old Testament, there was very little mention of spiritual ch uh, children. There was only physical children. So if you had no physical children... You had no children, period, in Old Testament times. 
Socially also, you were ostracized at best and called curse, cursed at worst. The examples of women like Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Hannah before they had children should tell us how devastating this was. Yet, the prophet Isaiah looked toward a time in the future when eunuchs would have a monument and a name. Now, this prophecy did not happen in Old Testament times. Eunuchs continued to be excluded from God's assembly, according to the law we mentioned earlier. The prophet Isaiah was predicting a future time, our time, our time, when eunuchs would be allowed in the assembly. So why would eunuchs be allowed in our time? Well, if eunuchs were initially disallowed because of imperfection, then, then their former exclusion highlights the one who is now perfect, taking their place in the assembly. Who is the perfect one? The Lord Jesus Christ. That same one has won for us, all of us, entry into God's assembly. Hallelujah. I get excited about this. This is described in the New Testament in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 to 19. Let's read this. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. The next verse, verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Wow. Note the phrase, a lamb without blemish or defect. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. He entered the Holy of Holies without blemish. He was perfect with no missing parts. Hallelujah. He entered into God's presence in order to offer his own blood once and for all. I'm so glad he who is without blemish entered so I being joined to him, I being joined to him can also enter God's assembly. What an amazing grace. So now eunuchs and all other imperfect, incomplete and blem blemished people like me are allowed to enter because of one perfect man, Christ. Isn't this something we can all relate to? We were all broken with missing parts, but Jesus' wholeness means we can enter God's presence today. And isn't it something to celebrate every day uh, of our lives? I'm also speaking as a Gentile here. I'm humbled by the fact that before the coming of Christ, we Gentiles were also excluded from God's assembly, just like the eunuchs. Remember the, um, the verses we read, read from Isaiah chapter 56? It talked about foreigners first and then eunuchs. But the Apostle Paul, writing to Gentile Christians in Ephesus, reminds us of this. Let's read Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 12. Paul says, remember, remember that at that time, in former times, you were separate from Christ, excluded from, the, from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in the world. It's good to be reminded sometimes the fallen state we have risen from. We had nothing, no hope, excluded. We were far off. With no hope, no God. And this was a plight not any better than the eunuchs. And we could only look at God from far away. Praise God for Christ. Praise Him.
Christ brought us close by his blood, despite our imperfections. Excuse me. Let's look at the next verse, Ephesians 2.13. But now, but now, remember before, but now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Astonishing grace. So amazing to me. Now, I would like to end this message by looking at one more point. I'd like to look at a blessed eunuch in the New Testament. And this is the third and final point today. Let's have a look. A eunuch for the kingdom of God. A eunuch, spelled E-U-N-U-C-H. I have trouble spelling that. (laughs) But that's your fill-in. A eunuch for the kingdom of God. I love how Scripture often reveals truth progressively. Let's have a look at this. In the Old Testament law, eunuchs were prohibited from entering God's assembly. Why? In order to show us that we are not whole, just like the eunuchs. Then Isaiah looked into the future and predicted the way opening up for eunuchs to come into God's assembly. Finally, in the New Testament, we actually see and read about what? An actual eunuch coming to God's assembly, which today is Christ's church. This story is in chapter 8 of the book of Acts. Because of space, I've only included verses 38 and 39 in the sermon notes, but I'd like to read the whole passage to you. If you have a Bible with you, you can follow along with me as I read Acts 8, 26 to 39. Acts 8, verses 26 to 39. And I'll read from the English Standard Version. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him read Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this, Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? Now, some old manuscripts here have verse 37, which we will skip. And verses 39, uh, sorry, 30. 8 and 39 are, are in your sermon notes. Let's read this together. So Acts 8, 38 to 39. Verse 38 says, And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. 
And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. What an amazing story. The Holy Spirit made sure Philip, the apostle, brought the gospel to this particular man, this eunuch, with a seeking heart. Why was a foreign eunuch singled out for this special treatment? I believe it is to show us this is the fulfillment of Isaiah 56, verse 5, which we read earlier. I want to read that again. Isaiah 56, 5 says, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Even the book the eunuch was reading was the book of Isaiah. Did you notice that? It's so symbolic to me. The Ethiopian eunuch was diligent at searching the scriptures, but he did not understand the salvation that was to come through Jesus Christ. He needed someone to explain it to him. And so God sent Philip to bring the gospel to him. We see a eunuch here who, remember, in former times would have been excluded from the assembly of God's people. But now this eunuch is fully joined to the Lord through baptism. I love how it says the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. He must have been overjoyed. When you thought you could never be accepted as part of a group, but then discover there is a way in, the joy is uns unspeakable. This portion of scripture from Acts 8 is the very last mention of eunuchs in the Bible. I find it interesting to note that this is the last mention of eunuchs. Perhaps after this, being a eunuch or not being a eunuch was no longer important. It reminds me of Galatians 3.28. Here in your sermon notes too, let's read it. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there female, uh, sorry, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. One could imagine extrapolating and, and saying, nor is there eunuch or non-eunuch. Being a eunuch may have been a difficult burden to carry, just as having an abusive past is a difficult burden to carry today. Yet, ultimately, we can relate to each other because of our unity in Christ. Our experiences do matter, but experiences or lack of experiences do not affect our identity in Christ one bit. This is important to understand, especially if you have an abusive past. Your scars do not give you your identity. Your scars do not give you your identity. Your union with Christ gives you your identity. In this respect, we are all the same in our Christ identity. Our experiences may differ, but it mostly means we can be uniquely effective in reaching out to different groups of people. I want to encourage you, if you have a past like a Unix, in other words, if you were abused, I want to encourage you to live out your identity in Christ because it brings healing when you do that. And let it be something that, once healed, you can actually use for God. Finally, I want to say something about the special tenderness the Lord has for those who have suffered in this sinful world. There is a parable in the Gospels. It's the parable of the banquet. And Jesus gives this parable, and he talks about a banquet master, which is a figure representing God. And this banquet master wants to fill his banquet room with people. 
he initially has a very limited guest list. But we note that those invited do not want to come. And they make all, all kinds of excuses. The banquet master, frustrated at the, at the invited guest's impertinence, then starts inviting the undesirables of society. The banquet master says, let's read this from Luke 14 and the, first part, and the second part of verse 21. The banquet master says, Go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. The poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. People not unlike the eunuchs who were imperfect. Perhaps God is calling you today in spite of your brokenness. Will you respond, repent and believe in him so that you can be part of his wonderful banquet? The choice is yours. These last two weeks, we have talked about people initially excluded from God's assembly. Last week, we talked about Ruth the Moabitess. Ruth was from, as we saw, an accursed race, a race that was cursed, the Moabs. She should have been excluded because of her background from the people of God. Yet she was humble and sought the Lord. And so by God's grace, she was given not only membership in God's assembly, but honor and glory in becoming the ancestor both of King David and our Lord Jesus Christ. Today, we looked at how eunuchs were similarly excluded from God's assembly because of brokenness inflicted by others. Yet, as we have seen, Christ opened a way for eunuchs to become full members of God's assembly because of Christ's wholeness, Christ's perfection. In our day, this can be a metaf metaphor for those who have been abused. What can we say? I can just say this. God's salvation is great. His grace is great. Never write off anyone because the most dishonored, insignificant, imperfect, broken individual can become the most honored, valued, whole and beautiful person through God's astonishing work of grace. Amen? The Moabitess the eunuch, which one do you relate to? Is there a Moabitess around you or a eunuch waiting for you to reach out with, re reach out to with the gospel? Someone from an unlikely background or someone with an abusive past. God is not done with this world. He wishes to unleash his astonishing grace on all, on everybody who will hear and draw near to him, regardless of background or experience. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you that if we have repented and we have believed in Christ, we are complete in our union with the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that no matter what we've gone through, and I know some listening have gone through very difficult experiences and circumstances. It doesn't matter because in Christ we are whole. So help us to walk through this. Sometimes it takes time for us to learn this and really walk it out and work, uh, walk through it and work it out. Father, I just ask that you will call those who are maybe listening and they're thinking about becoming Christian, but they're hesitating that today they will repent and believe on the name of the Lord Jesus. Call upon his name and be saved. And I pray all these things looking to your grace in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And today we'd like to end our service as usual with discussion and prayer at the nations we believe that we just we don't just uh
listen to a sermon and then go home. We actually go into gatherings, uh, which is our expression of church. So let's have a look at the discussion and prayer points for today. Number one, if you're able to share and you feel comfortable, please share what, about what elements of the eunuch experience you can relate to. In other words, have you experienced brokenness inflicted by others? And how have you resolved that? That would be encouraging for those around you. And if you are going through uh, resolution and healing, you can also share that too as you feel comfortable uh, with your church family and we can pray for you. And number two, let's pray for each other to reach out. We're here to reach out. If we have been healed, we are in a unique position to reach out to those who have been traumatized or abused. So let's pray that we'll be used as God's, God's vessels to reach out to those who, because of brokenness and trauma from their background, seem very far from God. Look forward to gathering in my own gathering and praying. Thank you so much for joining us here at The Nations. I hope you can join us again next week as we continue on this journey about grace. Please continue to pray for our pastor and don't forget to sign up for the financial update next week. Be blessed. Thank you. <laughs>